Hey, guess what's happening on this week's episode of the Beating Diabetes Lifestyle Podcast with your friend and host, Oscar Camejo. Diabetes is a growing global epidemic. It is estimated that by the year 2030, 643 million people will develop diabetes worldwide. The sad reality is there are so many people who are at risk of developing prediabetes and type 2 diabetes and don't even know it. We all know someone who may be living with diabetes. In fact, perhaps you're experiencing your own challenges related to diabetes and you want change. Chances are you started listening to this podcast because you're looking for common sense solutions to not only manage diabetes, but also to learn how to potentially reverse it in your own lives. Joining me on this week's episode of the Beating Diabetes Lifestyle podcast is my special guest, Jill Weisenberger, who is a registered dietitian, nutritionist and certified diabetes care and education specialist. Jill is the author of Prediabetes, A Complete Guide, Your Lifestyle Reset to Stop Prediabetes and Other Chronic Illnesses. So in this week's episode, Jill and I discuss the current state of diabetes awareness, the role genetics and lifestyle play in the development of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. We also discuss the connection between weight loss and reversing prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. I mean, folks, we discuss all kinds of topics. We give practical information that we know and I am assured of that you are going to enjoy. So find out how you can turn your lifestyle around and achieve better health, better focus, and potentially reverse type 2 diabetes and prediabetes you definitely want to listen to this entire episode. And if you would like to watch the full episode of this podcast episode on YouTube, be sure to click the link in the show description on whatever platform you listen to this podcast, whether it's Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, what have you. This show is being aired everywhere. So stick around to hear the rest of today's episode. Reversing prediabetes through simple lifestyle changes with Jill Weisenberger. Let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Beating Diabetes Lifestyle Podcast with me, your host, Oscar Camejo. And folks, I told you, this was going to be a, an awesome season. We're already into season two of the podcast. And I, as promised, I was going to bring on experts. And who better than to bring on than Jill Weisenberger? How are you doing, Jill? I'm great. And I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad. You know, when the publishing company reached out and was like, hey, we have this great author, this registered um, dietitian nutritionist. She came out with a second edition of her book. I really think you should have her on the show. And I'm so glad that we connected. Me too. Yeah. Me too. So folks, I want to go ahead and read to you her creds, her credentials, you know, when you have somebody like this on the show, you have to give props where props are due. You know, she's in, she's an internationally known and recognized nutrition and diabetes and prediabetes expert. I told you we're going to have only the best on this show. Told you. She has worked as a clinical dietitian and diabetes educator in a variety of settings, including hospital inpatient and outpatient programs, private practice and research clinics. She currently works with people with prediabetes through her original digital course, Prediabetes Turnaround. And we definitely want to talk about that. Through coaching, speaking, and working with the media, Jill empowers people to grab control of their health one lifestyle habit at a time. Additionally, she is the author of four well-received health and nutrition books. And we're going to be talking about one of those today, at least one of those. Uh, she's a freelance writer, a consultant, and spokesperson to the food industry. And she's a panelist for the U.S. News and World um, Report Best Diet Rankings. Now, I believe that probably doesn't even cover everything 
that you do. She's also a social media influencer and so forth. So again, welcome, Jill. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited. Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely want my audience to get to know you. So I wanted to ask you, and for the benefit of my listeners and those who are watching, uh, give us a little bit of background about yourself. How did you even come into this space when it comes to nutrition, dietetics, and so forth? Okay. Well, I came into nutrition kind of accidentally. It started with managing my own weight and my own health. And when I was in college, I had never heard of such a profession as a registered dietitian. I had never thought of nutrition. I didn't know it was a field of study even, but I met somebody who was studying it and we became friends. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. But you know what, Oscar? I was getting a degree in communications mm -hmm. with an expertise in advertising. Okay. And at being a senior in college and suddenly being interested in a science that requires math was very, very um, intimidating and overwhelming. So I kind of said, okay, someday I'll do that. Someday I'll do that. Well, I worked for three years in marketing, did not love it. And on a whim, literally a whim, hmm. I walked into the registration office at University of Florida and applied to get my master's in nutrition. And it took me four and a half years to get a two-year degree because wow. I had to start with algebra, Chem 1, Chem 2, Chem 3, Organic Chem, Biochem, all of that. Right. But so it was accidental. I just kind of followed my bliss. And, and it really came about with my own eating struggles. Hmm. But I love it. It's the best. Wow. That's right. Tell me about it. So now you talked about eating struggles and kind of accidentally getting into this field. Um, do you care to share some of those struggles? So other oh, people can sure. relate. I, um, you know, I was dealing with a lot of overweight, obesity as a probably like high school and early mm. college, and um, on the borderline uh, on the uh, eating disorder spectrum mm. as well. Understood. Um, but it, that's what got me interested because. I mean, I don't know. That's it. Just right. did, and then I learned about nutrition. Food not being bad. Food is actually good. Right. You know, that's like the crazy thing. Because when you grow up constantly thinking about your weight or being told, you know, don't eat that cookie. You had too many cookies or something like that. When right. you hear that all the time, you just think about food being bad. But food's not bad for you. Right. Food is amazingly good for you. Right. Exactly. And so it was just like a whole new world opened up for me. And, you know, I've just, it's, it's kind of interesting that my own messed up um, problem, you know, brought me to a career I love and the ability over the 32 years I've been in this field to yes. just help thousands and thousands of people enjoy hmm. eating again and, you know, taking care of their health and their lives and feeling energetic. Right. And, you know, that's one of the things that really resonated when I read through your book and I was reading a lot of the content that you um, put out. You know, you don't come across as this person who is just an expert and but you have no experience. You actually have personal experience. And I think that um, really lends to credibility, relatability, because uh, a lot of the listeners that tune in, I mean, they come from all walks of life. I mean, there are people who um, are new to dieting, if you will, new to nutrition, mm -hmm. as at least understanding it and turning their lives around because they're going through struggles. I mean, I get calls all the time, emails, text messages, and comments. So I'm, I'm grateful to have you on the show. So now, why did you focus in on pre-diabetes and diabetes? Why, why uh, niche down to that? So that also was accidental. Mm. Um, I was working various part-time consulting jobs while I was raising my young children. And my one of my former bosses called me up and she said, do you think you can pick up just nine hours a week in diabetes education? Because mm. I need to cut back my hours. She was raising kids too, same ages. And I said, okay. And I figured, you know, something I'll do for a while. 
And I've kind of expected to get bored in diabetes education Mm. because I thought of it like, oh, it's just going to be the same thing over and over. But it's not because every single person with diabetes is different. Right. They have different likes. They have different health issues. They have just different routines in their day. So there was never any boredom. And I really liked Mm. it. And I you know, sat for the the, the um, exam so I could be certified. And um, I just stayed in that. I've really enjoyed it. It's been like 20 years or so, mm. maybe a little over 20 years even. But um, yeah, I've just really enjoyed doing it. And the reason I, I moved into pre-diabetes, I haven't mm. left diabetes, Correct. but I expanded to move into pre-diabetes is because it's such a important stage to help people turn things around. Mm. Uh, it's it's a, a very positive stage. I think diabetes can be a very positive stage too. Sure. Sure. Um, but I think pre-diabetes is that opportunity. Mm. I always say it's like an alarm bell. Right. And so what do you do when you hear the alarm bell? You can either take action or not. Wow. And, you know, the sooner you take action, the better your outcomes are going to be. And the interesting thing is that a lot of people didn't realize, you know, until they got the diagnosis of prediabetes, that they had it and probably had it for a few years. Right. And then when they start changing things up, they realize they feel better than they've they've felt in in years because they right. they'll say to me, "I didn't know how lousy I felt till I started to feel better." Hmm. And I've heard that from so many people with diabetes, pre diabetes, sure. you know, just other just nutrition issues in general. Mm-hmm. That we get to this level of kind of accepting that this is the way we're supposed to feel a little, right. you know, sluggish, and then all of a sudden you have energy again. Right. It's nice. Right. So with that being said, you know, it always um, puzzled me, like why, like myself, when I was first diagnosed with pre-diabetes, you know, I was, everything that you just listed, the sluggishness and so forth, going to the doctor, finding out that I was pre-diabetic or had pre-diabetes back in 2018, why are so many people unaware, uh, particularly whether it's here in the U.S. or across the world, about the issues concerning pre-diabetes and why don't you think people take it serious enough? Well, I think a lot of people take it very seriously, mm. but the majority of people don't. And mm. my my perspective on that is what we call it. We call it pre-diabetes. Right. And I think a lot of people turn that into, oh, it's pre-problem. Right. And that's true with, you know, just the average person. Uh, and it's true with health professionals too. You know, there's a fraction of health professionals and not a tiny fraction of health professionals who are overwhelmed working with patients who are very, very sick. Right. And they think, oh, well, prediabetes, that's just not something that we have to deal with right now because we really have to deal with something else. Right. Um, so it just gets maybe not taken seriously, Mm. but you know, the American Diabetes Association, the CDC, um, I think it's the American Medical Association. They're doing a wonderful program. They've been doing it for years to raise awareness about prediabetes. They're doing a very good job. So I think we're getting more awareness, but you know, just, that's just my feeling that it's because we call it pre-diabetes. Right. Pre-diabetes. Some people say they'd like to call it like diabetes stage one or diabetes stage two, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And maybe that would be more um, kind of like a push to people to pay attention to it. Right, right. And I think before the nomenclature um, pre-diabetes came out, it was called something else years ago. And I, pre- I, I was listening to or I read somewhere that it was the actual term pre-diabetes wasn't coined until I forget when it was. Um, But do you have any insight? Yeah. I remember when it, um, when we had that term pre-diabetes, I don't remember what year it it was, but it's, you know, 15, 20 years, something like that. Um, And prior to that, we didn't have a term for that earliest stage. Right. But what we do, what we have always had is like impaired glucose tolerance. Right. That means that you have higher blood sugars after eating. And then we have impaired fasting glucose, which means you have higher blood sugar levels during fasting periods. Right. Um, 
But yes, I do remember when prediabetes was termed, and it's because they were finding that diabetic um, complications were starting earlier than they thought. Mm. So they moved to the numbers. I th- if I remember correctly, diabetes used to be diagnosed at a fasting blood sugar of 140. Okay. And at the same time, this is just like kind of pulling at my memory here, but at the same time that they came up with prediabetes, they lowered the threshold of diabetes to 126. Really? And that's, bec- and that's because they were finding complications of diabetes happening much earlier. Right. And what we know now is that it even happens in the prediabetes stage. So people really? with prediabetes are getting diabetic eye disease hmm. and, and other problems. Not at the same rate, right. but I mean, there are about 14% of people with prediabetes have diabetes eye disease. So with that being said, uh, you as a diabetes educator, a nutritionist and dietitian, what would you say uh, people should do? Should they wait till, you know, they start experiencing these symptoms to go get their blood work done? What do you think? Well, the the guidelines today suggest that we do this with adults who are age 35. Hmm. Um, But, you know, anybody who has some strong family history or some of the other typical things that go along with diabetes Mm -hmm. and prediabetes can certainly request to be tested earlier. So that might be high blood pressure, low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, that type of thing, because they tend to go together. Right. So if you have those, whether you're 35 or younger, I would just request being tested. Wow. And you know, I'm glad you said that the month of June is Men's Health Month. And usually I do a big push to encourage men in particular to go get tested, to go get checked, you know, because sometimes for guys, you know, we're we want to be Mr. Macho and, you know, I feel great. And, you know, yeah, I'll go when something, you know, uh, goes wrong. And that is the wrong mentality or that's not the best mentality um, to have where that's concerned. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I totally agree. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. There are people like that who just think I can put up with it. I can put up with it or probably nothing's wrong or I can deal about with it later. Um, but you know, in a lot of ways, time is of the essence because we have so much more control of our long-term health, Mm -hmm. the earlier we start taking care of it. Right. So it's the same thing with like, um, think like atherosclerosis or scarring of the arteries. Right. The, the longer you have exposure to, you know, the toxins and high cholesterol, cigarette smoke, high blood pressure, the longer you have that, the more likely you are when you're older, you know, to have heart disease. Wow. So you don't want that exposure early. Exactly, exactly. And so uh, how do you foresee yourself um, creating greater awareness? I know you have the new book that came out, the second edition, and we're going to get into that. But as a whole, how do you hope to make a difference when it comes to diabetes awareness? Well, I, you know, like you said, I do have the book and I'm out on social media and I have my blog and so forth. And I do a lot of public speaking. So I hope that I personally can help raise awareness, but it's not an individual kind of thing. Correct. You know, it's, it's got to start with family practice doctors Mm. and it, you know, I think as individuals, we need to take responsibility ourselves. Certainly everybody who Okay, if you know people, then you know people with prediabetes right. and diabetes. Right. You do. Right. So, I mean, I'll, I often say, like, if you just walk into a crowded, let's say, a sports arena, and you count out 10 people, chances are that one of them has diabetes mm. and three of them has prediabetes. Wow. Three of them have prediabetes. It doesn't mean they all know it, but chances are that they have it. So certainly, from an individual level, you can think, well, you know, a lot of people don't know it. A lot of people don't know how important it is. Mm. A lot of people don't know how they should be screened. So, you know, maybe in November for Diabetes Awareness Month or June for Men's Health Month, you can just say, I'm going to ask three people to take it seriously and get tested. Right. So we can all do something. Right. Good. I like that. You know, sometimes when they say it takes a village, um, sometimes we have to do it with one village member at a time so that we can make it. 
a big difference. And so I'm glad that we're sure. both a part of this village and there's so many others out there. So mm -hmm. um, when it comes to prediabetes, type 2 diabetes and the reversal of it, right? Because a lot of people don't know what that actually means. Well, before we get into kind of breaking down from your um, uh, expertise, the difference between prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, what would you say um, is the, what is your position on the reversal of these uh, conditions? Um, we have seen people go into remission Many, many people mm -hmm. in with prediabetes and people with type 2 diabetes go into remission. And when I say remission, what I mean is they'll have normal blood sugar levels sure. or if they have prediabetes, they'll go and they'll have normal blood sugar levels for some period of time without the need of any medication. Mm. So that would be they reversed it and it's now in remission. There's some, you know, a little controversy about the word reversal or remission, right. meaning different things. When I say it, I mean the same thing. Right. So I think that it's ideal to try to get blood sugars back to the normal level if possible. Correct. It's not going to be possible for everybody. Correct. But if possible, that's ideal. Because like I said, people in the prediabetes range already have some level right. of eye disease, kidney disease, and nerve disease. Mm. So it's not like um, it's a totally benign place to be. Right. So typically when somebody is diagnosed with prediabetes, the goals are to prevent type 2 diabetes or delay type 2 diabetes. And certainly I'm all for that. Right. But ideally, I would like to see normal blood sugar levels again. And you know, I'm glad you said that because when I was diagnosed with prediabetes, right, and then uh, later on diagnosed with full-blown type 2 diabetes, not once was I told that it can be potentially sent into remission. There was no discussion of that at all. I stumbled onto um, that terminology later on. You know, I originally I was told I was going to be on medication for the rest of my life. You know, and it, it just didn't sit well with me. The more and more I learned, you know, I was told, you know, eat better, try to exercise. Here's a sheet of paper you know, just hope for the best, but you are, you're always going to be on blood pressure medication. You're always going to be on, you know, insulin. Um, so that, that was really concerning for me. And I know with some situations it's very more complicated than others. You know, mm -hmm. I'm grateful that I was able to get my blood sugar levels, my A1C and so forth back to normal. I'm off medications completely is going on well over a year now. So I'm happy about that. And like you, I want to help other people as well. So uh, briefly, can you uh, talk about the difference between prediabetes? You alluded to it before a little bit, but the difference between prediabetes and type 2 diabetes specifically. Sure. So prediabetes is really the same problem as type 2 diabetes. It's just mm. earlier on in the continuum. Mm. So it's a progressive problem which is why the longer you've had type 2 diabetes, the harder it is to go into remission. Mm. So your best opportunity, whether you have type 2 diabetes or prediabetes, to reverse it and go into remission is today. Because the longer you've had it, the harder it is. But they're the same problem mm -hmm. on a continuum. So when we say prediabetes, we're talking about pre-type 2 diabetes. Correct. Um, and so let me just tell you what the two problems are that are always present. Correct. One there is some insulin resistance. So various cells in the body mm -hmm. use insulin for a variety of reasons. Right. And one of them is to push blood sugar from the blood into the cells. Right. So if, we, if the cells are resistant to that, they don't take up blood sugar very regularly. So the sugar just stays up too high. The other problem is what we call the um, loss of insulin producing ability. Right. So if early on when somebody, even prior to prediabetes, somebody has very high insulin levels and normal blood sugar levels. So they the blood, the insulin is so high that it can push the blood sugar levels down to the normal range. 
So that's kind of like pre pre diabetes. Right. No one has any idea there's a problem right. because the blood sugars haven't gone up too high yet. Mm. But as the body is less able to make more insulin, then it can't push it down all the way and blood sugar levels start to rise. Mm. So early on, insulin levels are high and blood sugar levels are normal. Then insulin levels are not as high, blood sugars go up to the prediabetes range. Right. Then insulin levels are not as high as that, and they go up to the type 2 diabetes range. Mm. And then eventually, somebody could have type 2 diabetes for so long, they cannot make insulin, and they need to have insulin injections or insulin pump. Right. So for the sake of those who are listening and watching, obviously, the pancreas is what naturally produces insulin, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's what our bodies are designed to do. Um, so there's yes. a difference between the naturally occurring insulin and the medication insulin. And so um, when the scarring of the pancreas happens or the, the pancreas starts to get overworked, you know, that's kind of lending into what you're saying. Now, the, ins the insulin is or the pancreas is not working like it's supposed to, to absorb all right. of that blood glucose or blood sugar, as people would call it, and it remains in the bloodstream um, longer than it right. needs to and so forth. So I wanted to Exactly. So to early on, when the body says, oh, mm -hmm. there's a little insulin sense, right. insulin resistance going on, right. the pancreas just puts out extra insulin. Right. And so by the time you get to the prediabetes range, you know, you could say, well, my pancreas used to put out enough insulin and now it doesn't put out as much. Right. That that's basically what it is. Okay. So there's always those two problems, whether it's prediabetes or type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's that loss of the ability to to make enough insulin, right? And the insulin resistance. So you always have both of those. It's just on a continuum, right? Right. So, but what do you say to those people? Is like who say, well, you know what? I hear what you're saying, Jill and Oscar, but you know, if, once you get prediabetes or type two diabetes, you're stuck with it. It's, it's genetics and you can't do anything about genetics, no matter how good you uh, decide to eat and what you drink and exercise is not going to make a difference. So I might as well just live it up and enjoy my life. Oh, you're killing me, Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. No. Right. Um, what do I say to those people? I guess I'd probably say the same thing. You're killing me. <laughs> right. Um, well, genetics absolutely plays a role, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Right. Genetics plays a role. Right. But it's not 100% of it. Right. And whatever hand of cards you've been dealt, you play it out as best as you can. Right. And so, you know, my husband says things like, um, you know, when people will say, well, I know somebody who smoked and drank and blah, 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 and they live to be 99. Right. And, you know, my husband wants to say, well, I know somebody who closed their eyes and walked across a busy street and still survived, but it's not very smart. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you can, you can, uh, you just do the best that you can. Right. Now, there are plenty of people who have prediabetes and type 2 diabetes who live healthy lives already and they still have it, mm. you know, but there are often some tweaks that we can do. So I, I mean, I've had so many people over the years I've worked with who, who ha don't have any weight to lose mm. and their diets are pretty good. Mm. Their diets aren't perfect, but they're pretty good. Right. And they don't want to lose any weight because they don't have any extra weight to lose. And maybe they exercise, but there's tweaks with that too. So right. we tweak the exercise. We tweak the 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 diet it doesn't necessarily mean that everything you're eating is wrong right you know right. it's like you can have a good diet and still have these problems right but you can improve your diet mm -hmm. wherever it is good or junk food diet <laughs> right you know wherever it is right. you can make an improvement right and it's going to make a difference not just in this area but in so many areas of life. And you know what else? Sleep, I think, is very important. Mm. Sleep makes us more, uh, poor sleep, lack of sleep, right. makes us more insulin resistant. Mm. So if, you know, if somebody is just, maybe they have insomnia or maybe they, you know, just have a busy life and they don't get enough sleep, I would start prioritizing that. Mm. Because you have to give your body enough time to recover consistently, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of, 
you know, whether you're sleeping during the day because you work at night or vice versa. But I definitely agree with you on that. And um, I know some people with um, sleep disorders, they have certain challenges and so forth. So right. um, that's a very interesting topic. We'll probably spend a whole podcast just talking about sleep. I know. I've, well, there is a chapter on sleep in the book. Oh, in yeah. Pre-diabetes, a complete guide. There's a whole chapter on sleep. And I think the, the science is getting stronger and stronger. Where is it? Mm -hmm. And so for those who are listening, the book that she mentioned um, is The Pre-Diabetes, A Complete Guide, Your Lifestyle Reset to Stop Pre-Diabetes and Other Chronic Illnesses. This is my copy, fresh. I love it. You know, <laughs> I'm like you. I have a publishing background and marketing background. So this is a very good book. And we're going to uh, have Jill to talk a little bit more about this book. And there's a couple of things in here I want to reference um, when it comes to um, reversing type 2 diabetes, sending it into remission, um, specifically pre-diabetes, I want us to get into that. So Jill, a few moments ago, you talked about uh, some of the people that you're able to help that come in to see you. So uh, what are you finding are some of the common issues that they're dealing with, like certain risks that they're and risk factors that they're experiencing? What would you say? Oh, it's very common for the people I work with to not have only high blood sugar, mm. but also to have high blood pressure, to have high triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol, often high LDL cholesterol. And then very often there's other things going on sure. too, like thyroid disorders mm. or, um, you know, various types of autoimmune diseases. There's a lot of things going on with almost everybody, you know, mm. but it's really important that we don't look just at blood sugar right. because if all we didn't want to, wanted to do was look at blood sugar, we could just stop eating, right? right? If you don't eat anything, the, you're not going <laughs> right. to have a post meal right. blood sugar rise. Right. So there, but, but we can't just do that. Right. We have to look at all of our 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 health metrics right and including how we feel right. and other things right so it's not it's not just a blood sugar problem right and I, i'm glad you said that because in your book you talked about controlling the abcs i love that section mm -hmm. so can you explain a little bit to our audience what does that actually mean controlling the abcs sure so we have to think about overall heart health it doesn't matter what, where you're coming from in your, you know, your health journey, what diagnosis you have. If you are a person, you have to be paying attention to your heart health. Right. So we all have to. But people with di diabetes and prediabetes do have higher risks of heart disease. Mm. So this group of people needs to take a doubly hard look at that. Right. So when we talk about the ABCs, we're talking about the ABCs of heart health care. Mm -hmm. So A is A1C, or we're really talking about blood sugar. Right. So A1C is that average blood sugar level. It's an estimated average what your blood sugar level has been over about a 12-week period. Right, right. So when we're talking about A1C, we're talking about that. We're talking about blood sugar. B is for blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Really important that we keep blood pressure under control. The earlier in life that you have out of control blood pressure, the more likely you are to have heart disease and stroke problems later in life. Mm. So a lot of, I know a lot of people think, oh, I'm young. I can deal with it. What's right. the big deal? Right. No, it's that, that length of exposure. You're young. That's probably means more likely sure. that you're going to have issues with heart right. disease that if you don't control that. Um, and then C is for cholesterol. Right. We want to make sure that LDL cholesterol is, L stands for low. So we mm -hmm. want that number to be as low mm -hmm. as possible. And um, second, to the, second to that, we look at um, HDL. H is high, and we want that number to be as high as possible. Right, right. So I know there are people who I talk to who come to me and ask for help. You know, how do I start this journey? How do I start, you know, um, this reversal or remission process of prediabetes or type 2 diabetes? And they're really mostly concerned with their weight, you know, mm -hmm. but they don't think about sleep. They don't think about what's going on with their heart. Um, and I tell them, you know, what was going on with me? You know, my story is an open book. I let them know I, I used to have issues 
with my breathing going up and down steps. I had lack of energy, you know, yes, my uh, triglycerides were off the charts. A lot of things were going on. And, but like so many people, I focused just on weight, right? Um, I was 268 pounds, like I mentioned before. So what would you say um, to those people uh, about the connection since they are focused on weight loss and, you know, their Mm -hmm. body composition, um, what would you say is a connection between weight loss and reversing prediabetes? So we have research studies that have actually looked at this and keep in mind, not everybody with prediabetes or type two diabetes has weight to lose. Right. You know, it's my, I don't know the numbers specifically, but my experience is about 15% Hmm. of people who have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes have no reason to try to lose weight. Mm. Um, so, so it's just not even relevant to, to a fairly decent fraction of people. Right, right. But for the other people, if you choose to lose weight, if you have excess weight to lose and you want to lose weight, I am 100% for that because weight loss does make our bodies more insulin resistant. Mm. So we can lose the weight, become less insulin resistant. That is a path to reversing prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Weight also affects um, blood pressure. Mm. So it's I, I think these are really good goals. A mm. couple of things I want to say about it, though. Sure. Losing small amounts of weight make a difference to risk. So we're looking at 5 to 10% of body weight makes a difference in risk. So for somebody who weighs 200, right. that's only 10 to 20, 20 pounds. Right. So you do not have to get to your fighting weight or your high school bikini right. weight or right. anything like that, you know, right. to, to see an improvement in your health. Mm. But there's one concern I have with people focusing on the, the weight. Mm. That is because weight is an outcome. It, that's all it mm. is. It's an outcome. You can get weight loss by not eating, mm. by that one guy now, I, um, Kevin McGinnis is on TikTok mm. talking about the McDonald's diet yeah. where he eats, he eats half portions of McDonald's breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack right. for a hundred days. I don't know where he is now, but he's already lost more than 40 pounds, Right. but it's a calorie deficit diet. I right. have to swallow a tapeworm or get cholera <laughs> right. and I can lose weight, but that doesn't mean those are smart ways to do it. Right. And that, but it, you're only looking at the outcome. What's mm. really important is the process. Right. So if you... Pay attention only to the outcome. Like I said, you could lose weight on McDonald's. You could lose weight on the jelly bean diet or the the broccoli diet <laughs> right. or anything like that. Right. But by paying attention to the process, mm. you will lose weight. Right. And then you have all these healthy behaviors that are going to sustain you for your life. Right. So I, I rarely ask people to put the emphasis on the weight, even mm. though we might have a weight loss goal. Right. Um, may or may not. Right. But by, like I say, by putting the emphasis on the process, how am I going to get three meals a day that are balanced? Mm -hmm. How do I get to the grocery store at least once a week? How am I going to get some meals on the table that my family likes? Where in my day am I going to put in my exercise? That's where the all the time and effort should be going. Right. Those things. Right. And then the weight comes. Mm. But don't focus on the weight. Right. Exactly. Because the weight may come, but what do you have? Right, because I remember um, I was getting ready for my 30th high school anniversary, I mean, um, graduation, right? <laughs> and I was so determined. I was like, I'm going to lose 30 pounds by this 30th, you know, uh, high school reunion. That's what it was. And so I was just focused on, I, I want to beat that goal, beat that goal. But in that process, I was thinking like, okay, but what happens after the reunion? Yeah, I went, I lost the pound, the, the weight, but I started thinking about nutrition. What's really going on inside my body? You know, I, I was losing the weight, but I was still on high blood pressure medication. So I'm like, you know, there's still mm-hmm. something going on on the inside, you know? So, oh, were you going to say something? 
Well, I was just going to say also when weight is lost very, very quickly, right. particularly in an unhealthy way, we have loss of muscle mass. And that is mm. just so detrimental, right? particularly right. as we get older. So, I mean, if you're in your 30s and you lose a few pounds of muscle because of a crash diet, right. and then you do it again in your 40s, you know, it's like... By the time you're 70, you're right. not going to be able to get out of a chair without help. Right, exactly. And so with that being said, there's a section in your book that I, I wanted to highlight. And um, again, the book is A Pre-Diabetes, A Complete Guide by the one and only Jill Weisenberger. Weisenberger. How did I pronounce that? How do you pronounce it? Weisenberger. You Weisenberger. Right. Okay. Weisenberger. So um, she has a section in here. It says, our... Di- excuse me, our obesity, pre-diabetes, and type 2 diabetes lifestyle diseases. And she delves into this, but I want you to kind of talk about the lifestyle. Is it a lifestyle? Di- di- uh, uh, are these lifestyle disorders? Well, I tend to think of it as health problems that have lifestyle solutions. Mm. So we often hear about them as lifestyle diseases, but you know, we already alluded to the fact that genetics does play an right. important role. Right. And there are plenty of people who have healthy lifestyles and still get these still have these problems. Mm. So it is not it couldn't possibly be only a lifestyle. It's just that's not possible. Right, right. But also the term itself, it's a lifestyle disease. That sounds a little bit demeaning. Right, right. Um, so I don't I don't like that expression. Mm. But there are lifestyle solutions. Mm. But that's the same thing if you have type 1 diabetes, which right. is completely unrelated to lifestyle and 100% right. an autoimmune disorder, right. but there are still lifestyle solutions. Right. And I think when we can talk about that, we put ourselves in a place of power right. because that means we can take control. So in that respect, I like saying lifestyle mm-hmm. when I tag it to solutions, but right. not when I tag it to right. disease. Especially because you have a lot of um, folks who want to blame <laughs> Who want to blame the person who's overweight or who's obese? Yes, who's and that is obese. so. That is a that is a conversation, Oscar. We could have that would last a week, right? <laughs> right. Because obesity is not a matter of being lazy, right, or being sloth like, right, or sitting on the couch eating too much. It right. is so much more complicated. So than much that. more, right. And I'm getting ready to do a podcast uh, episode on SAD, you know, the standard American Mm -hmm. diet, um, and just kind of delving into what that is and so forth. So um, what would you say uh, and what would you say to people who want to um, deal with the struggle that they do have with losing weight? They know, hey, I do want to lose weight. I do want to get the pounds off of me. Yes, I want to reverse pre-diabetes, I want to keep the weight off, but how would you recommend that they go about achieving lasting results? Well, I think there's a lot of options. So there's not like a particular way to go. I'm also a big fan of people working with their healthcare provider and making Mm -hmm. appointments with registered dietitians um, or a registered dietitian who's also a certified diabetes care and education specialist. So I think that is always, you know, an option for people who, who have access right. to that. I think that's a good option for people who have access to that. But again, I would go back to putting the emphasis on the process. Mm. So I think it's great to say, okay, I have a goal. I'd like to lose 10 pounds. And I would think in s- steps of that, you know, right. 10 pounds, not 80 pounds. Right. You know, I'd like to lose 10 pounds and I'm going to go about it doing these things. Right. And then put your effort on doing those things very, very well. Mm. And it is fine that it takes time. It's not a race. Right. So be the be the tortoise, not the hare, I right. guess. Right. Take your time and and make it work. But you could be the the hair and lose that ten pounds in a matter of a couple of weeks. But you've just right. ha- you've wreaked havoc on your body right. and haven't learned anything, haven't taken care of yourself. So I would definitely go, like I say, with the process. Right now, specifically when we're talking about blood sugar control, mm-hmm. there's the first things like the low hanging fruit. Everybody's going to have different low hanging fruit. Right, right. But to me. You know, I think if you're drinking sugary sodas or sugary beverages of any kind, 
That's a low hanging fruit. That is mm. one thing. It may not be easy to give up, but it's one thing that can have huge impact. Mm. Maybe the low hanging fruit for you is that you're very sedentary. Right. And so you could take three 10 minute walks, one after breakfast, one after lunch, one after dinner. Right. So I would pick whatever is like the easiest for you mm. as well as the most impactful. Mm. So some combination of simple and impactful. Right. And there's just a lot of ways to go. And so with that, because there are a lot of options out there, um, how would you caution people against um, some of these fad diets, these diet trends that promise the world, you know, lose 50 pounds in 30 days, quick, fast, and, and in a hurry. Can you expound on that a little bit? And what's your thoughts yeah, on- Yeah, you you're just you stabbing my nutritionist heart here, <laughs> right. Oscar. Um, okay, I think that we just have to understand that there are people out there who are going to try to sell us something right. that isn't going to be to our benefit. So we have to, to, to look at it through the lens of, let me do my homework, let me be cautious. Mm. But number one, if somebody is promising- Weight, easy weight loss, we got to know right then that right. it's a scam. Right. Because if there were an easy way to lose weight, do you think there would be a single person left trying to lose weight? Right. If an easy way existed, right. every single person would be slim. Mm. And so there is no easy way. That is number one. Understand that. So steer clear of anything that promises you, mm -hmm. you know, some rapid, easy weight loss. Right. I would also steer clear of anything that to ask you to give up all kinds of health, health boosting foods. Right. You know, you're not supposed to eat this long, long list of foods. Right. I don't know. I, to me, that doesn't sound like a, like a very healthy or sustainable way. Right. Um, so how would you pick something that's good for you? You know what I really like the best, Oscar? And, and you can, um, you know, you can personalize this to sure. whatever that you'd like. But when it comes to like what, what to eat, I like just the simple old plate method. Mm. Take an average size plate, a right. nine inch plate, nine you know, inch. not one of these big right. platters, right. but just a nine inch plate, divide it in half. Half of it is non-starchy vegetables, so mm -hmm. it's like broccoli, carrots, radishes, Spinach, asparagus, zucchini, right. tomatoes, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And divide the other half of your plate into uh, a protein-rich food and a starchy food. Mm. So the protein-rich food and the starchy food are about the same amount. Right. The non-starchy vegetable is double that. Mm. So you can, it doesn't have to be a plate. Just think about if you were having... A stew. So right. you look into your bowl and you think, well, I have about as much starch as I have protein. Right. So let's say potato and beef. Right. And this about, about the same amount of non-starchy vegetables. So I'll have a salad. Right. To make that to make that non-starchy vegetable twice as much. Wow. Uh, and it can be anything you want. You can have it as a casserole, a, a mm -hmm. soup, stoop, a soup, a sandwich you know, a bowl, a plate. And if you like fish, you eat fish. If you don't like fish, you eat something else. If you like tofu, you eat tofu. Right. You know, so you can make it anything you want. Right. And by the way, so I know and I'm learning how much you love cooking and you love talking to people about cooking and nutrition. <laughs> Folks, did you all know she has a special recipe for, I think it's blueberries and fudge or something that you had, uh, yeah. I was like, oh, I have to try this because I love both blueberries and I love fudge. So you definitely have to check her out on her social media. And she's going to talk to us about that in a little bit and how to follow her on social media when we get to wrap up. Now, Jill, you have to tell us as in your field of nutrition, you love cooking. Tell us about your experience in Hungary with the Chef Parade. I don't know how you knew about that. <laughs> I guess it was on social media. Um, okay, so I have this thing that I I love to travel mm -hmm. and I love to experience a, a country through its food. And not mm. just a country, but other regions of the U.S. I really want to experience through its food. So I try to 
cook wherever I go. And mm. I was with a group of, of other nutrition professionals for a, a small conference. And I think the conference started at you know six in the evening or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I arranged for a group of us, maybe, I don't know, 12 or 15 of us to go to a, a cooking school. So they took us to a market and showed us the various food and we bought the things and we came back and we cooked it and we ate it. And it was just so much fun. And yeah, Chef Parade was a great a great choice for us. I've done that in China. Wow. Um, I cooked in Ireland. And I just did that in Italy wow. recently. I went on a food extravaganza wow. through Milan and Barcelona. Nice. I decided that I was going I had been to Italy before, right? And I'd been to Milan before, so I didn't need so much to see all the sites, right? But I wanted to experience it through food, mm. so I hired somebody to take me to the grocery stores mm. and restaurants and stuff like that, and I hired somebody else to teach me some cooking. It was great. Wow! See, uh, and that's what I love about your content and just hearing you talk about it because. You know, to travel abroad and to learn different cultures, learn how to cook in those areas, you know, I think that's so great. And you know what? Food can be fun. Food is fabulous. Right. See, that is the whole thing Mm. that changed in my life. Mm. Like I said, I grew up, food is bad. Right. Food is, you know, something, you know, you you indulge in it because it tastes good and that's bad. Right. That's crazy. Mm. That is crazy. Right. That is no fun. Right. <laughs> but when you look at it, it's like, I have all these different things to enjoy. Wow. And look at these beautiful berries and mm. all the nutrients that they're giving me. Right. And look at how I can take these beautiful blueberries and mix them with <laughs> delicious chocolate. Yes. You know, and it's and you don't have to eat this much. Right. <clears throat> Excuse That's me. Okay. You don't have to eat this much because- You've just given yourself permission to eat it because it's delightful. Mm. You know, you're not not trying to like, oh, can I get away with this? Right. You know, it's like you give yourself permission because it's delightful. Right. How do you feel That's about great. air fryers? I haven't used one before, mm-hmm. um, but I mean, I've had food from them. Mm-hmm. I, my daughter has one. I think she really likes it for things like Brussels sprouts and and cauliflower. Right. Um, I don't know, but people who have them love them. Right. I, I would. I, I just don't really see the need for me personally. Right. Right. But like, if I had one, I would enjoy playing with it. I think. Yeah, you know, because there's some people that come to me, they're like, and they're saying, "Oscar, I'm just too busy. I'm a working professional. You know, uh, my family's busy, and by the time we get home, we just don't have enough time to cook." And I know in your book, you have tons of. Uh, healthy eating recipes and how to even get started. So for mm-hmm. those people who are like, you know what, I, I, this is just too complicated. It's easier for us to just grab something, you know, from the healthy option at the fast food, but I can't see us really turning things around. What would you say to those folks? Well, I might start off by talking about one of my former patients mm. who had a habit, a routine of every single night. So we're talking 100% of the time going to fast food Hmm. to pick up dinner on her way home. I think she had a long commute and she would go to fast food every single day. Hmm. And, you know, she wants, she had great ideas. I'm going to, you know, lose all this weight and this amount of time. And I'm going to never do this and never do that and blah, 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 blah. Well, this is somebody who never cooked ever Hmm. at home. And what are we going to do with that? You know? So what we did is in the beginning, we took the four, I remember doing it with a piece of paper like this. Mm -hmm. We folded the paper into four pieces. Right. We took the four fast food restaurants that she went to most often. Mm. We looked up online for the best options that she would like there. And that was her personal menu. Mm. So if she went to McDonald's, she had a choice of those four options. If she went to Taco Bell, she had an op- a choice of those three or four options, that kind of thing. Right. And so that was a way of her easing in to making better choices. Mm. And then, you know, now she cooks at home most of the time. Oh, wow. But yeah, it was just, a, I, I think baby steps mm. are the way to go. 
And for her, that was the perfect baby step. So instead of having all the options at McDonald's and having to to make a choice and look at that big menu, she just looked at her own personal menu. Right. And made her choice from that. And then, you know, then it was maybe taking home um, just like a fast food sandwich and having it at home with a salad Mm. and another vegetable. Mm. And so she just made those baby steps. And there's nothing wrong with with that. I mean, I think that's ideal. Right. So, I mean, I'm not a, a huge fan of fast food, right. but I mean, this was a way that it worked for her and now she is so much healthier, nice. you know? Um, and she's not eating fast food very much at all. Nice. But use convenience foods, get a list of what I call back pocket mm. recipes or back pocket meals. These are things that, you know, you can whip up sure. with pantry staples. Okay. So, You know, I know when I'm super busy, I can make scrambled eggs, grits, and some vegetable. I can roast it or take it out of the freezer and do something with it. Mm. So I know that that's like a standard. I have another one that I do with um, white kidney beans or cannellini beans, Mm. and I with and I roast it with um, tomatoes and different vegetables, whatever vegetables I have and some feta cheese. So I just know that there are some things right. that I can always do. And I'm also getting ready to be exceptionally busy. Mm. So I'm think I'm thinking ahead now, what can I put in my freezer? Mm. So um, I can have a nice meal without having to take the time to do it. So I'm not a huge meal prepper in that Mm, sense. I know a lot of people like to do that. Maybe they'll on Sunday, they'll do meal prepping for the whole week or something like that. I'm, I take a different approach to meal prepping. I just maybe will cook two trays of, of roasted vegetables instead of one. So then Mm. I have, you know, something left over Right. or I'll cook, you know, a big pot of black bean soup instead of a small pot of right. black bean soup. So in in that way, I have, I, I usually have something that's already ready to go. Okay. But um, so yeah, think about meal prepping. Think about convenience mm. foods. Think about having back pocket meals. So let's just say you planned, you thought you were going to get home early today right. and had plenty of time and you were going to make this nice meal that you'd been looking forward to, but there's a traffic accident and you get home late. Right. What do you do? Well, I mean, you could, you know, go to Pizza Hut or, you know, call DoorDash or whatever. (laughs) But if you have some things in your mind or written down on a card, what are your back pocket meals that you can always pull together? Right. What about a tuna melt? Mm. You know, pull a piece of bread out of the freezer, get a can of tuna out of the pantry, slice a tomato, put a piece of cheese on top. Right. And you've got the start of a meal. Right, right. And you know, I'm so you just have to know what those things are, right? Right, and I'm glad you said that. Um, one thing that I had to do for myself was get rid of everything in my house that I knew were was challenging for me. That was mm-hmm. the cookies, so I stopped buying the cookies, the chips, the sodas. You you mentioned about liquid calories oh. earlier. I got rid of a bunch of things. That was me personally because I knew every night I had to have something sweet. You know, Mm -hmm. I had it was Pop Tarts or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And sometimes I would just always be snacking, 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 snacking. You know, even after having dinner or lunch, I just had this bad habit. For me, it was a not so good habit of just constantly Mm -hmm. snacking. And, you know, that did contribute to a lot of things. And once I started doing what you were talking about, which was simplifying, um, making, eating, I made it easier for me to eat healthier. You know, I got, Mm -hmm. I cleaned up my environment, if you will. And um, meal prepping, I'm the same way. You know, I I don't do the meal prep, but I do, let's say if I have um, salmon, I do, you know, I may buy a big slab of salmon, cut it up, season it, have it ready to go. So Monday, Wednesday, and maybe Friday, I may have some salmon. I like lamb. Um, But the goal of basically what you're saying and what you cover in your book is to make it simple, still enjoy eating and have fun with it. Um, And speaking- Yeah, I always say make easy your best friend. Make easy your best friend. Go for easy. All right. Did y'all hear that? Make easy your best friend. 
Awesome. Awesome. So we're going to wrap up um, today. Now, in her book, she has tons of simple recipes, right, to make things easy, to help you along the way. I, but I wanted to take a different approach or get your thoughts. Why did you include even preparing um, to do the lifestyle transformation when it comes to eating? And you put in here a bunch of um, recipes and food choices. Why? This is not, is this just another cookbook? You know, it is not a cookbook. Right. It is definitely not a cookbook. There's right. about 25 recipes. I'm not right. sure exactly the number. So it's not a huge number of recipes, right. but they are examples of mm. the things that I talk about. Mm -hmm. So I talk about how you can make your meals, um, you know, maybe lower in calories and lower in carbohydrates. Right. So I give examples through recipes or how you, I think I have in there like a lent, I do have a lentil yes. chili in there. Yes. So talking about how you can get lentils, which have wonderful resistant starches in them mm. that help with uh, blood sugar control. Right. So how you can use lentils instead of beef in something. So there's right. a lentil chili recipe in there. Mm -hmm. There are very, the, all the recipes really try to just give a, a lesson. Right. Or there's a gazpacho in there, which is a cold tomato mm -hmm. vegetable soup. Mm -hmm. And I have that in there because they're all non-starchy vegetables. It makes like this much and it's so low in calories and so filling that my family just runs through it on the in the summer mm. we just I just leave it in the refrigerator and I can always start a meal with that and and get that edge of, off my hunger or mm. I can even you know t have it as a, a snack in the afternoon so that's what the recipes are there for oh good it's to 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 give you guidance on how to make the foods you already like to make mm. more healthful mm. or how to try things that maybe you have never tried before wow and to make easy, what was it again? Make make easy your best friend. Make easy Be, your best make friend. Make easy your BFF, best friend forever. That's right. That's right. Well, Jill, um, how can people get a hold of you um, if they want to follow you on social media and actually contact you to learn more about you know, reversing pre-diabetes and so forth. How can they get in touch with you? Um, sure. They can come to my website, which is jillweisenberger.com. So if you can spell my last name, you can find me jillweisenberger.com. You can also find me on social media as Nutrition Jill. Nutrition Jill. So I'm Jill. on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest as Nutrition Jill. Okay. Um, yeah, and you can find the book in any bookstore. Mm -hmm. And sure. I would love to hear from people. So I love it when when people read my blog posts or read my books sure. and contact me and give me some feedback. It really makes me happy to get that. Yeah, and I'll include links to all of that information in the show notes, everyone. So definitely make sure you after this um, podcast, you actually go down and look in the show notes to get information by Jill and how to contact Jill. So Jill, one last question. What's on the horizon for you in the future when it comes to diabetes education and so forth? You know, I really like teaching online. Mm. So I think I'm going to do more online digital courses. Mm. I really, really like that. Also, Oscar, I'm going to be a grandma. Wow, you're too young to be a grandma. <laughs> For the first time. I'm very excited. <laughs> wow. We're going to have another little girl in the family. Oh. So I'm going to babysit two days a week. I've okay. already volunteered or pushed my way in right. to do that. I'm not sure which way right. which it was. Okay. Um, but yeah, when it comes to diabetes education and prediabetes education, I I really like the online courses that I've been mm. developing and teaching. And um, I do have another book that needs a second edition. It's mm. Diabetes Weight Loss Week by Week. So maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do a second edition on that one. Wow. Yeah, I actually um, listened to the audio book of that. Oh. Yeah, I believe it was the audio book recently. 
Um, yeah, actually, um, about a week or so ago, I stumbled on Tether oh. the week by week. So I told you I'm a fan, Jill. You know, we're, oh well, thank yeah, you. I'm really, a fan too. Yeah. I'm a fan of yours. Thank you, thank you. Well, um, Jill, you're welcome to come on the show anytime. If there's anything, I would that, love to come back. Oh yeah, and then we can drill down on some other topics. Okay. Well, Super. there you have it, folks. An awesome interview with my new friend in the diabetes education space, nutrition space, Jill Weisenberger. Thank you so much, Jill, for being here. I really appreciate you being here today. Well, there you have it, folks. It was a great episode. And like I always say, stay focused, keep moving, never go back, leap forward, bounce back because you can, my friend. And above all else, trust God. You got this. I believe in you. Be sure to visit the website at www.beatingdiabeteslifestyle.com for access to free resources and other information that will help you along your journey. If you would like to submit a question or comment about the show or to learn more about the Beating Diabetes Lifestyle, you can always email me at hello at beatingdiabeteslifestyle.com. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Beating Diabetes Lifestyle Podcast with Oscar Camejo. We hope you enjoyed this episode. As a reminder, this podcast is intended for motivational and educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional care by a physician or other healthcare professional or qualified fitness instructor. This podcast is provided on the understanding that it does not constitute medical or professional advice or services. If you're looking for help on your journey, seek a qualified medical practitioner. It's important that you utilize someone who is a trained, licensed healthcare professional who can help you on your journey toward good health.